Welcome everyone. You found Sanctuary's Coffee and Conversation Show. My name is Myrna Haskell. I'm executive editor of Sanctuary Magazine. This is an online publication for women that empowers and inspires. Our focus is the arts, philanthropy, health and wellness, culture and community. You can find us at sanctuary-magazine.com. This morning, my guest is Cheryl Brown Merriweather. She is Vice President and Executive Director of iCare. That is the International Center for Addiction and Recovery Education. Good morning, Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Good morning to you and to your community, Myrna. It's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, thank you. And today, folks, we have a very serious subject, and Cheryl has lots and lots of information and, and important things to tell us. Our topic is dealing with challenges for women in recovery. And so, Cheryl, I wanted to uh, dive right in because uh, we have a lot to discuss, but I wanted to start out with a lot of those articles and things we've been seeing in the news about an uptick in percentages of women suffering from substance abuse, particularly alcoholism and alcohol abuse. And I was hoping we could just segue into the rest of the topics by you talking a little bit about your experience there and what you think about this issue. Awesome. Yes, indeed. So it is a very serious topic, and it's actually one that is not new there's always been issues with individuals struggling from alcohol use disorder, but we've seen an uptick, as you so appropriately mentioned, particularly among women and particularly among older women. And so there's many questions about why is that? What's happening? Well, you know, we're living now in this new post-pandemic era, mm -hmm. and some would say it continues because of the total disruption that began as a result of that. And, you know, it's causing stress, Myrna. It's causing stress and it's causing distress. And women in particular seem to often bear the brunt of handling things and making sure that things are as much as possible normal and productive and continuing to happen as they should happen. And those are things that we particularly feel like we own within our space. So alcohol use disorder is something that's progressive. It occurs over time. And as stress and distress arise among us, it is one of those things that people will seek to handle. We want to cope with it uh, the best way we know how. And we live in an alcohol-centric society. If yes, you I was hoping you'd bring that up. We do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Everywhere you look, it's it's normalized, right? So we wine look for mommies, right? You know, relaxing after work, go right to the wine to grab a glass of wine, right? Your name that it, thing. Yeah. That's it's promoted big culture. time on yes, television, yes, yes. all these different programs and everything, right? Like it's a normal thing to do to relax. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. That's what it is. And it continues, it it progresses over time. You know, what many people don't realize is alcohol use disorder is labeled as a disease by all the medical professionals. It's classified as a disease, but it's a progressive disease. It's one that grows over time. You know, in the beginning, it's just fun or we relax a little bit with it. But before you know it, you've built up a little bit of tolerance where you need a little more to get that same right. level of chill. And then before you know it, over the years, it becomes more of a dependence. We depend on it. We need it in order to feel normal. And at some point, again, over time, because it is progressive, you may begin to lose control. And that's where the disorder really becomes classified. It's the definition of having lost control over this. And at that point, Myrna, it's seriously affecting people's health overall. And they may not even realize that some of these other health problems that they're struggling with, the root of those can be traced back to some of their alcohol use over period, longer periods of time. For example, cancer cancer and, and alcohol disease and so many other things with respect to the liver and just overall health and wellness are affected by continued progressive use of alcohol to resolve some of our day-to-day uh, -day life challenges that we face. 
Do you think there's a little bit of a lack of fear too there because it's more of a long-term progression in many, many cases that, you know, everything seems to be fine. You know, you're out with some friends for dinner, you share a bottle of wine, you know, you go for cocktails after work with some colleagues and everything is sort of normalized and there's nothing wrong at that point. And as you mentioned before, it's sort of a slow progression and you might need more to get that relaxing feeling, mm -hmm. but because it's not one of those substances where addiction happens right away and there's all of this negative news about it, that it's almost worse because so many people think it is okay to have more and more because they're not seeing the results right away, the negative results. Right absolutely away. correct. You're absolutely correct. And the key word here is normalization, right? The perception is that this is something that everyone does. And I tell you, the marketers are really good at what they do. And you look <laughs> anywhere, you see beautiful alcoholic beverages. How many pictures do you see on social media of these amazing, colorful drinks that look just so appetizing or, or so, so much incentive for you to embrace them? And it is normal. But you know what, Myrna, one thing I just want to mention is not everyone gets into that. Right. There are probably about one third of the population that do not drink at all, despite what you would be led to believe by some of the marketing that we see and the perceived normalization of it. But think about this, you know, many women who are not, who are pregnant will not drink alcohol for religious reasons. Many people do not consume alcohol for health or medical reasons. We're often told don't drink if you're taking this medication because they do not go together. So again, despite what you may be led or your listeners may be led to believe, there are, and people in recovery, let us not forget, there are some 24 million people in this country who have gone on a personal journey to get to a place of sobriety and into recovery from the disease of alcohol use disorder. And they count the number of days since they had their last use of alcohol or other addictive substances. So just again, many millions of people in this country do not consume alcohol. And I'd like to see us normalize that a I little bit. I think there's more. a little bit of a push I'm seeing though. I don't know if you've noticed that. I've been seeing it in social media. There's mm -hmm. these new brands coming out, you know, alcohol free, you know, I yes. feel so much better about myself. And yes. I heard you men mention the beautiful drinks and that's so true. You know, the mixologists doing these wonderful different drinks with the colors and the aromas. And I've actually seen a few restaurants now offering specialty non-alcoholic yes. drinks that have the same look, you know, with the high-end bitters and aromas and things, but with no alcohol, they're, they're offering that now. And so I think that there's a little bit of something going on out there over the last year or two where oh, people are trying to combat some of those alcohol promotional pushes. It's more than a little bit of a movement. You've, you've described it accurately. It's a growing national movement. And you may, we're, as we're taping this, it is January. So this is oh, right. dry January. And as you mentioned, I went to a five-star restaurant with my daughter recently for my birthday and they offered, we didn't have to ask. They said, hey, we are featuring some special zero proof cocktails this I month. I love that. Because many people are, are, you know, taking this plunge, if you will, in dry, in January under the dry January label. And there, you may have heard there's a sober September or sober October. So this is a movement. And just in case your listeners don't know, a lot of that came about from a book that was written by under the title of Sober Curious. And what the author of the book, it. Sober Curious, encouraged mm -hmm. people just examine your relationship with this substance. Pay attention to how you engage with this substance. What causes you to want more of it? Or how do you feel if you consume less of it? And it really did begin a grassroots movement that now has grown 
and has been adopted by many because you find that you feel better from a health and wellness perspective if you are substituting something that really when you consider it it's not totally healthy at for you some scientists are saying now that you know abstinence really from a health perspective is the best way but everyone's not there right so let's just examine the what we're doing and how we're engaging with these substances and let's see how we feel from a health perspective if we cut back a little bit and for many that's a little of that goes a long way so that's what you're seeing and you're right it's starting to grow and percolate up all over the place and we're glad about it because it results in more health and wellness on the part of the individuals who substitute healthy behaviors and, and substances as opposed to less healthy behaviors and substances so Cheryl, before we came on today, I did a little bit of research, obviously, on this topic, and I was finding a few articles that were, were written about women being less likely to receive treatment for substance disorders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what do you know about that? What are some of the causes of that? Do you agree mm -hmm. with that statement? You know, what have you found personally with all of your work you've done through eye care? Okay, so you, the question is about treatment. Yes, yes. I want to sure I, okay. treatment. And I have some yes. of my own ideas yes. about why that may be, but I want to hear from you. Okay. Well, first of all, let's talk about treatment in general, Marna. Okay, good. So uh, in general, po general population, only about one in 10 individuals who need who meet the clinical definition of needing treatment for a use disorder are able to get it. So that statistic in and of itself is alarming. And why do people in general not uh, find themselves able to access right. and, and treatment? Well, it's a cost factor, first of all. If you don't have insurance, you cannot afford oftentimes the expense that's associated with the treatment. Okay. And then if you have that problem solved, there's access. Uh, there are not enough beds in inpatient treatment centers and alternatives to inpatient treatment are not readily available. So those are general population statistics. Now let's talk about women in specifically. What do women do? They are primarily the caregivers, right? So they are the ones responsible to take care of the kids. And I have to make sure I go to work and I can't take time off from work. And oh, by the way, what is the stigma and the fear that's associated with this disease and this condition in general? It's pervasive. No one wants to admit to needing treatment for these types of disorders. So again, women are the primary ones who feel the responsibility, not saying that men don't, but we tend to process these things within ourselves. What will happen? Who will take care of the kids? Who will make sure they get dinner? Who will, I've got to get up and go to work. What will my boss say? Yes. Um, but the system itself is just flat out broken. Uh, there are so many barriers and I want to just let your lead, your listeners know this one stat. I don't like to get hung up in this, but this paints a picture for why this is a it's more serious problem. Yes, for women, but at the macro level, Myrna, the uh, American Hospital Association wrote a letter to Congress in December of 2022 and said the behavioral health system of care is broken. Yes. There are not enough physicians. There are not enough nurses. There are not enough mental health and behavioral health practitioners that are uh, in within the system to care for individuals who need treatment. So when you compound the shortage of treatment providers and services, with these other barriers, the stigma, the logistics. And I'll say this is a fact as well. Many women just feel like we can handle it, right? Whatever yeah. I'm dealing Multi -taskers, with. Multitaskers, we can do everything. Yes. I, I yes. can handle this. I've mm -hmm. got this. I don't need clinical treatment. Are you kidding me? I got too much going on. I got this. I can cut back 
anytime that I want to. So they simply are not ready to do more than just kind of cut back on my own. So I'm so glad you brought thing. that up, Cheryl, because that was actually one of the things I had in my mind, this whole idea about multitasking and doing everything for everyone and putting your needs last and how this kind of a thing can either be a gift or a curse, right? Yeah. And in the case of when you're using some sort of substance yes. to try to artificially bring your stress down and make you feel better about yourself, about your situation, about your, your daily, yep. uh, your daily expenditures, your daily responsibilities, you know, Absolutely. all of those things. You know, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we um, got it. I, We're I used to love, handle. Yes, I'm sorry, Cheryl. Go ahead. I just said we can handle it. We we always handle things, right? That's right, what we right. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about specific challenges, and one of the things I was thinking about was disclosure. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's scary, obviously. It is. So somebody who is really in trouble that maybe has even come to the realization that they are in trouble. And they know that it's going to take going into a program or at least some sort of outpatient program that is going to affect their daily schedule and their daily lives. This, this idea of disclosing to your employer because you have to take time off or to loved ones. I mean, a lot of our uh, audience, you know, they're also taking care of elderly parents besides their regular responsibilities. And so there's this disclosure factor as a challenge. And I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit because I know that your organization does deal with employers and employees. M Myrna, this is a great question. And it really gets right to the heart of the challenge in terms of getting people the help that they need, particularly for individuals who may be in the workplace. Now, you know, I am also a practicing HR professional for more than 20 years. I've worked in the HR field in all sizes and types of industry and businesses. And I'm still very involved, even though I work in substance use disorder, I'm actively engaged with my local SHRM chapter, if you're familiar with the affiliates of the Society for Human Resource Management. And we talk about this a lot. HR folks, let's just keep it real, are not the go-to people. When these issues come up, people are struggling with them. They have questions about them. Now, the companies view this as something under risk management, right? So we put systems of care in place to make appropriate referrals to folks when they need services. And we have insurance companies and EAP service providers that are in place in many cases, not every case, but in many cases when some Someone needs critical care or they ask or self-identify that they want help or as a result of an incident in the workplace, then we know what to do. We protect confidentiality and we make referrals where we can or in some cases, let's just keep it real, Myrna, they will do disciplinary action. Depends upon the nature and the severity of the issue. And that is why folks are very gun shy yes. about going to HR. So here's what we recommend. And it's a marvelous change that's happening in terms of organizational culture. If you look at the continuum of care for services under the behavioral health umbrella, treatment really kicks in about halfway through that continuum at the point in time when an individual either they recognize that they need help or something happens, right? But mm -hmm. treatment services just are not there, not going to be there. I think we may have even mentioned that. The American Hospital Association wrote a letter to both houses of Congress in December of 2022 and said the behavioral health care system is in a crisis. They don't have the workforce to support individuals who need treatment, and those services will take years to heal and restore. So what do we do, Myrna? We talk about prevention, and that is where, in the workplace in particular, uh, the companies are putting systems in in place that will allow employees to get help 
often from other employees without having to go through human resources. How is that happening? They're using, sometimes they call them employee resource groups. Sometimes they're calling them affinity groups, but these groups are organized in the workplace for individuals who have what is called lived experience. They may have personally experienced a substance use disorder for themselves or a family member or loved ones or other coworkers, and they know how to navigate to get people the help that they need, connecting them with online resources, connecting them with local service providers. So these groups, Myrna, are employer sanctioned, but they are then employee led and they can be an extension and a help to the human resources practitioners. We have some amazing women who work in the health and wellness industry who are getting trained and they're getting certifications and they're learning to establish these groups within the workplace. And yes, many of them cross over gender get barriers, you know, they include everyone, but there are also amazing organizations and groups that are being formed that are particularly targeting to provide support for women. So okay. it's a very exciting time to have a means by which people can get connected, can protect their confidentiality without having to always feel the the that they are must overcome these barriers and go right. through human resources, which can sometimes just be punitive when we're That's speaking. Right, and they'd be more apt to reach out in this case. Absolutely. Yes. yes. I love to hear that. I didn't know about this. I think that's truly a step in the right direction. Yes. Um, Cheryl, uh, I had also read somewhere that women are more apt to relapse after a short-term recovery or a, a, a situation in their journey where they feel yep. like they've come out on the other side and then there's a relapse. Yep. So there's two parts to this question for you. Do, have you seen that that is the case, that it's difficult, particularly for women? And then if yes or no, what can we do as loved ones or family members to help mm -hmm. them through that journey? Because I do understand it is a journey. You mm -hmm. know, it's not always a case where somebody goes into even inpatient recovery mm -hmm. uh, services and come out and then everything's fine for the rest of their lives, right? Well, yes. Often people do have this journey of relapsing and trying again and maybe mm -hmm. doing better for a while. So I just yep. wanted to talk about that piece a little bit with you. Absolutely. Women are tend to be more social oriented individuals. We love the company of other women. We love the company of our friends, our girlfriends, our families. And we often seek solace and comfort in the companionship and the friendship of our women. And we've already mentioned the fact that culturally, socially, alcohol is a big part of those wonderful relationship experiences that women often share with their girlfriends, their mm -hmm. sisters, their BFFs, et cetera. And, but one of the things that really particularly happened as a result of the pandemic was the resulting isolation yes. and disconnection that has happened. So a lot of those familial relationships, those social relationships that sustained us and strengthened us have been broken. And you, when you add to that, what we call a VUCA, if you're not familiar with that term, it's an acronym that stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. That's the nature of the world in which we live now. In fact, there's a new word in the dictionary, Myrna, it's called PERMA crisis. The HarperCollins Dictionary said we are in a state of permanent crisis in, in the world. And so permacrisis became a word that got added to the dictionary. So there's so much disruption that is continuous. There's so much of that plus loneliness. I don't know if you've 
realize this, but the U.S. Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, came out with a report last year that talked about loneliness. Yeah. And loneliness is, and the lack of community and the lack of those relationships is perpetuating the stress and the anxiety and the fear and the suicidal tendencies. When you add these things together, it is a perfect storm for relapse, for yes. increased misuse of substances and other unhealthy behaviors. And because women do are more by nature empathetic, Yes. more sensitive within our hearts and our beings. Yes, we are more susceptible to be impacted by these things. So consequently, if we're on a road to healing and recovery and sobriety, bam, when something else comes up and it comes up often and frequently, we're going to, if we don't have our girlfriends or other accountability partners, to support us, then we may in isolation do what we need to, we feel comfort ourselves or self-medicate. And that is what leads to the overuse and misuse of unhealthy behaviors and substances. So that's, that's excellent. I understand all of that. I want to just dig in a tiny bit too. I heard you mention isolation mm -hmm. on numerous occasions and with social beings and, yes. and the empathy lots of times that women have. And so something that loved ones can do is of course not judge first but then just say I want to be there for you can I come over can yes. we sit and have a cup of tea and just talk through it like yes. what kinds of things do you tell family members you know that they can do to help the person that's struggling with recovery what you just said, and I love the title of what you're doing here, it's Coffee and Conversation, right? It's Reach Out and Connect with Someone. And the one of the other silver linings of what is happening in this space since the pandemic is we now all know how to, almost all of us know how to use Zoom or Google Meet or Facebook Live or some of these things. So in fact, I had a, a family member contact me as recently as yesterday, wanting to get support for a loved one, a woman in their family who was really struggling. She had, I mean, was really advanced in her in her disease. She had, you know, had a couple of DUIs up under her belt, had some legal problems, and this had gone to rehab numerous times unsuccessfully. And this family member was saying, "What can I do to help?" this dear person in our family. She's a mother, she's a wife, what can I do? So one of the things that I suggested was in fact connected him with an organization. I'm not sure if you or your um, audience has heard of She Recovers. Are you I think I, I actually, I think I have. She Recovers, right? Right, so I use them as a wonderful example because She Recovers, started with a Dr. Don Nickel and her daughter out of Canada with a Facebook group for women. Now you imagine all types of women are somewhere alone, struggling or pondering these things that they're dealing with. You know, am I thinking about doing something? Do I realize I have a problem? But they don't know who to reach out and connect with and talk to about these right. things. So Dr. Dawn formed a Facebook group with her daughter and they called it She Recovers. And it allowed women all over the world through technology to reach out and connect into a Facebook group. Well, That's that wonderful. group of women now consists of somewhere in the neighborhood of 325,000 wow. women worldwide. And there's every type of community you can imagine within that larger community. There are women who focus on wellness, health and wellness, or yoga. There are women who are into music and poetry and art. There are artists and actress, actors in the group, you know, so there's a group of women who 
can reach out and connect with other women who share their interests and their passions. So through this group, there's something for everyone. You can be sober curious and you can explore this. They have even extended to local groups within local communities through some of the efforts and the circles, if you will, that are formed. They have professional recovery coaches that have gone through training to work with women one-on-one -on -one for That's those wonderful. who want additional accountability or who want to work with a group or a coach one-on-one. -on -one. So again, it's an amazing thing. And, that, and there are so many of them out there now. That's one of the larger ones. They do retreats and things around the country. So that's one of the one that is most commonly known. But the the role of the family member is to share information, to raise awareness, to create safety with their loved one around these issues so that together we're connect we do better together, right? So that together we, we can- We say that all the time, different Cheryl. We're better options. together. <laughs> different options. Let's explore a group. Yeah. Let's look for an online community. I found a book. If you want to read how about Holly Whitaker's, you know, uh, like book about uh, drink like a woman. It's a fabulous book that explores the role of the culture and society to promote use of alcohol as, as a means of coping and hanging out and getting along in, in society today. So there's, again, just the knowledge is powerful the, and that comes from being safe enough to ask the question and connect with people who are more than willing to share their personal story or to help you connect with others who can support you. And that is what we do and why I'm here today is to help people know that there's so many amazing things happening in this space and so many people willing to help. So folks can just reach out and connect and we'll help guide them to make some of those uh, things possible for them. Well, that's a perfect segue into me allowing you to tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do for eye care and the resources and supports that eye care offers to folks. So go ahead, you have the floor for that, Cheryl. Oh, thank you so much. So I care the International Center for Addiction and Recovery Education. We're located here in Central Florida. We've been around for more than 25 years, training initially uh, clinical addiction counselors and recovery support professionals who worked in clinical settings. And that expanded to a second division about 10 or 11 years ago, where we shifted in addition to supporting the clinical model of treatment, those who worked in that space, but we started working with professional coaches who wanted to learn new skills in learning how to work with individuals who may be, you know, wanting one on one accountability, may not need clinical services, but are looking for someone who could work with them to set goals and move forward to handle or manage their behavior with respect to substance misuse or addictive behavior. So we created the Certified Professional Recovery Coach Credential. And we have trained more than 2,000 individuals from 41 nations, wow. many of them um, the most amazing women that you would ever imagine. Some of them are nurses. Some of them are school teachers, HR professionals. I even have airline pilots. I have attorneys and soccer moms. <laughs> That's but great. They want to make a difference. And many of them are solopreneurs. They start their own businesses. They find their own clients and they write books. They do presentations. Some are doing presentations in faith communities, others doing presentations in the PTA meeting and others recently, but around the time of the epidemic, 
asked us to help them do more with respect to the workplace. How do we create conversations in the workplace yes. or in our community around these topics? So we created a third division just to support the workplace. And we created a facilitator program. It's a train the trainer that teaches individuals in how to do presentations, either live or online to break the silence around these topics. We give them the slide decks. We teach oh, them how great. to you know, create safe conversations. So we train individuals who are recovery support peers, professional recovery coaches, addiction awareness facilitators, and they are rocking it in their communities and in their workplaces, and they're doing it all over the world. And we grow through partnership with people who see the value of identifying those high, highly motivated, passionate individuals who have many of them a story that they have based upon their own journey. And we give them the knowledge and the skills and the community of support to, to continue to grow and accomplish their personal goals, whatever those may be. So it's a quick, these programs don't take a lot of time. They don't take a lot of money, but you come away with a credential that's very credible and being part of a reputable worldwide recognized organization. And we're get we're, we're doing this again, health and wellness practitioners are our partners, HR practitioners, treatment programs, and just individuals who want to make a difference. And some of them are looking to add a supplemental stream of income. So if folks are interested in learning more about that, I'd love to share more about that with them. And we're going to have, as soon as we close out here, Cheryl, we're going to have links to both iCare and to your personal LinkedIn page so that folks can ask you questions if they need to personally as well. So I just want to thank you so much for being here today, though. Such an important topic, so many things and so many ways we can do better. And I love that that's what your organization is looking at. How can we do better? Yes, we've made mistakes in the past, but how can we get through this, particularly after the isolation and all the problems we have? from the pandemic and everything. So thank you so much for being my guest today. I truly appreciate it. And I appreciate the work that you're doing. And I appreciate that you invited me to be part of it. So thank you oh. so much. Oh, it's been great, Cheryl. Thank you so much. I'll close as I always do by wishing all of our listeners and our readers good health, happiness, and continued inspiration. Thank you so much for joining us today.